brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the society that we live in, there is a recognized awareness of the importance of having good role models in your life. If you do not have good role models, then you can easily fall into all sorts of trouble and and traps in this life. We as Christians also recognize the need for good role models. For examples of what it looks like to be mature Christians. Well, in our text, we find such an example an example that we are to follow. And in our text, we also see the need for why we need to follow them because after Paul speaks about uh, following uh, an example and, and imitating a mature Christian, then he also speaks about enemies of the cross of Christ. There are those who do not want us to run the race with perseverance that Paul spoke about in the verses just before our text. They want us to give up on our faith, to stop running, and to follow them into a path of destruction. With that in mind, then, I proclaim God's word to you with this theme. Join me in imitating the mature. Two points, imitate me, and then no shame. Now, there there is a a play on words in verse 15 of our text, the beginning of our text. There we read, let those of us who are mature think this way. Well, that word mature is the adjective for the word perfect in verse 12 that we looked at last week. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Those words are very similar In the Greek. Now, Paul is not suggesting that the mature are perfect. He made that very clear as we looked at last week. He he is not perfect. But rather, he is using this, this play on words in order to gently exhort the mature in faith, himself included. And what is he exhorting the mature about? He says there, let those of us who are mature think this way. Well, this way is referring to what he has just spoken about in the verses 12 to 14. The mature in faith, he is making clear, are not some elite group. They are not those who stand above the pack, who stand above all temptation or the possibility of falling into sin. It is not as if the mature in in faith are no longer touched by the troubles of this world. The mature in faith know and are open enough to admit as they they run this, this race of life that they are weak. And so the mature press on, not pretending that they have it all together or giving the impression that they are stronger than they really are. Instead, they press on in the strength that God provides. They press on knowing that Jesus Christ has already made them his own. And so so the mature run on with an ever-increasing reliance on the Lord, putting no confidence in themselves and ever keeping their eyes on the prize, on, on Jesus, that author and perfecter of our faith. And those of us who are mature know this. Those of us who are mature ought to think this way. And regardless of your own level of Christian maturity, all of us need to keep thinking this way, to keep maturing in this way, to keep running with our eyes on that prize on Jesus as we slowly run towards the finish line. Now, there were those, though, in Paul's day who did not fully agree with what he had had said there in the verses 12 to 14. And and he uh, addresses them also in verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. There are those who think differently 
than Paul did. Now, we shouldn't have in mind here some major point of of doctrine. If that were the case, Paul would have called them out explicitly, those who were opposing him in this way. And he he speaks openly in the next chapter, calling uh, two women to agree with each other in the Lord. So if it was a major point of doctrine here that, that Paul had in mind, he would not have said, you know, the way, he wouldn't have said it the way that he did. He would have been stronger. So we assume here that it was some minor quibble that they had with Paul. Maybe they didn't think that his sports analogy was appropriate to the Christian life. Maybe they thought that they were closer to perfection than Paul suggested. Maybe they thought that, that there was more benefit in looking backwards than, in, than straining forward to what lies ahead. We, we, we don't know. We do know how Paul responded. He, he, could have, he could have come down hard on them, even on this minor uh, issues, these minor issues. He should have said to you, he, he could have said, if, if any of you think otherwise, shame on you. I'm, I'm an apostle after all, don't you know? I have the authority from Jesus Christ himself. Agree with me, even, even on this. That is not his style. That is not his nature. In the summer, I did a bit of running to stay in shape. Some of a, a few of, of the little ones, my kids, would join me sometimes. They'd run as, their, as fast as their legs could take them, and then they would stop exhausted. No matter how many times you would tell them to pace themselves, they would do the same thing over and over again. No argument, no amount of logic will convince. But as they mature, I'm confident that they will begin to see the wisdom of running at a steady pace. Well, this is the confidence that Paul is expressing here when it comes to those who think differently than him. He's not too hot and bothered by it. If any of you think otherwise, God, God will reveal that also to you. As, you. as you mature, you will see things more clearly. And Paul realizes that maturity in faith takes time. It does not happen all at once. And, and remember, this church in Philippi was a young church, and it was also young in its faith. And so rather than strong arm the less mature on some minor points here, Paul has patience. Paul has the wisdom of the good shepherd to allow God who began a good work in them to, to carry it on to completion. And it is good for us to remember this as well. It is easy for those who are mature in faith to sometimes get frustrated with those who have not yet reached their own level of maturity, who are behind them in the race, so to say, whose minds are not as shaped by the gospel as they ought to be, who might struggle in their devotion to Christ in some way. We ought to be patient with one another, as Paul was patient with the Philippians as Jesus Christ has and continues to be patient with us. Now, rather than dwell on this minor quibble any farther, Paul breaks off the discussion uh, in verse 16 and and brings it back to, to the main focus. He says there in verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. You could translate only there as, in any case, let, let's, let's move on. Let, let's keep the guiding principle firmly fixed in our minds. We are all works in progress, far from perfect, but in Christ we, we press on together, striving for the goal of perfection, trusting that our maturity in faith will grow as the marathon continues and as God does his work in us. Let that be our focus for ourselves, for each other, for the church as a whole. And what Paul says in verse 17, the beginning of verse 17, is is quite striking, maybe even a bit brash, we might think. Brothers, join in imitating me. 
How many of us, even if we be leaders among the church, would dare to take these words on our lips? We might wonder, has Paul maybe slipped here? Is he not in danger of undermining the very thing that he has been affirming? Is he not putting too much confidence in him, in his flesh, thinking too highly of himself? But we need to think here, what exactly is it that, that Paul is calling the Philippians and, and calling us by implication to imitate? It's, it's not his perfection. He's, he's made it clear. He's, he's not perfect. It is his honest assessment of himself that he is not perfect. It is his utter reliance and dependence on his Savior, Christ. His knowledge that Christ is holding him fast. It is his determination to keep on running. To press on toward the goal of perfection and the prize that is in Christ. That is what he calls the Philippians to imitate about him. There's nothing prideful or brash about it. And this is just what the young church needed. They needed a, needed a model of what a genuine Christian looks like. Paul was perfectly suited to be that model. He knew them well. They knew him too. And they knew him enough to think that, that or to know that, that he was not thinking too highly of himself when he told them to imitate him. We should note too, though, that Paul was not so vain as to think that he was the only one worth imitating. Now look at the rest of verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul realizes that there are others who are worth imitating. Others who have been touched by the grace of God in Christ. And we can think here of Timothy. We can think here of Epaphroditus who Paul held up in chapter 2 as examples of those who were working out their salvation with fear and trembling. There ought to be such people among us today as well that we can imitate. And surely we ought to expect the leaders of the church to be among such models. 1 Peter 5, speaking of the elders, they are said to be examples of, of the flock. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. That is not to say that church leaders will never have struggles with sin. If that were the case, none of them, myself included, would be fit for office. We are not models of perfection. But we are models of works in progress, models of weak people finding strength in a powerful God, in a faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what Paul modeled to the Philippians. That is what church leaders must model today, too. What we all must model to each other, especially to the next generation and beyond who are just learning to run this marathon. And so, beloved, join me in imitating the mature in faith, and may we all strive in faith so that we might too then be models to others of what it looks like indeed to run with perseverance, ever relying on Christ and the grace of our God. In verse 18 and 19, we discover the urgency and the need to imitate Paul and others like him. There in verse 18, we read, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And you thought grown men shouldn't cry. Here we find Paul speaking about how he weeps. We are not Stoics. We are not unmoved by the pains of life. We are not unmoved by the hard truth that Paul goes on to speak about here. 
Uh, the word many there at the beginning of verse 18 is directly connected to the enemies at the end of verse uh, 18. For many, for many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. It's not just a few. It's not just some. It's many. Many are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, we might think at first glance that these enemies of the cross are more like Paul prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus, persecutors of the church. But the description of these enemies in verse 19 are very different from the enemies that persecute the cross of Christ, that persecute his church. Look at how Paul describes them in verse 19. He says there, their end is destruction. Speaking of the enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory. And, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. There's four things mentioned there. Their end is destruction. That is the, the end of every enemy of the cross of Christ who forfeits his soul. And the destruction here is not annihilation. It is eternal destruction. What Jesus calls in Matthew 25, eternal punishment. In a place where Jesus also calls elsewhere the fire of hell. Beloved, there is such a place. Hell is real. Many have traveled its well-worn path. Many more will. Some we know by name, don't we? They are members of our families, our friends, neighbors, co-workers. They're on the wide road that leads to destruction. If they do not repent, if they do not turn to Christ in faith and place their lives in his hands, their end will be destruction. They will be cast away from Christ for all eternity. Their end was enough to make Paul weep. May it be enough to make us weep too. And enough for us to warn them in love. To direct them to Jesus and to the eternal life that is found in him. These enemies, verse 19, go on to say their God is their belly. This is very little to do, if anything, with those who have dieting problems. This expression highlights the all-consuming pursuit of personal satisfaction, of wanton self-gratification. For such enemies of Christ, nothing is off limits, no sin is taboo. When your God is your belly, all forms of immorality, every evil desire, every passion, is fair game so long as you can stomach it. They glory in their shame. It's one thing to fall into serious sins. Many of God's people have done that. It's one thing to fall into serious sin and then to be ashamed of what you have done, to be grieved by it, to plead with, with God that He would blot out your transgressions, that He would cleanse you with the blood of His Son, that He would create in you a clean heart and, and renew a right spirit within you. It is quite another altogether, you understand, that instead of being ashamed of what you have done, you glory in it. That is what these enemies of the cross are doing. They, they glory in their shame. They glory in the things that they ought to be ashamed of. They call good what God in his word calls evil. They turn black to white or gray. Now we expect this from those who don't know God. Who have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And we see it in our culture all around us, don't we? Especially these days in regards to sexuality and now transgenderism. The sad thing is, is that there are also churches and Christians who glory in what they ought to be ashamed of. 
what God's word clearly condemns. There is a church in in Guelph, some 10 minutes from here, that has a pride flag on its sign with something like the words underneath it, everyone welcome. Now we do not need to heap shame upon shame on those who might struggle with their sexuality or with their gender. We, the people of God, are not immune to such struggles. They are real. And we ought to bear each other's burdens, but we cannot, we must not, be more accepting than God. He has made us in his image. Male and female, he created us. He has designed sexuality in the way that he has designed it. And so we must glory in Christ not in what his word calls shameful. Finally, these enemies have a mindset that is twisted and warped. Their mind, verse 19 says, their mind is set on earthly things. Earthly things is Paul's way of speaking about things that are sinful in the eyes of God. These are the things that that must be put to death. We read about them in Colossians chapter 3. And you noted, as we read it, the similarity of the language. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And here Paul says in verse 19, right? They have minds set on earthly things. And so what are those things that are earthly in us that need to be put to death? Well, Paul makes a a long list for us, certainly not exhaustive, but enough for us to get the Get the gist of it, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. He adds to the list in verses 8 to 9 of Colossians 3, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, lying to one another. Yet these are all the things that the enemies of the cross of Christ glory in and embrace. We must not. We must fight against these desires the moment they pop into our hearts and into our minds. We sang from Psalm 1, and you might know that there seems to be a progression from walking to standing to sitting with the wicked. In the end, Psalm 1 is clear that the wicked are like chaff. They are blown away, they are destroyed. When we, when we step back and look at this description of, of those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, we, we find a similar thing. What initially begins with, with a mind set on earthly things, sooner or later ends up in glorifying these earthly things that we ought to be ashamed of. And eventually it leads to to making a God out of your self-gratification. And finally, when your your self-gratifying belly is your God, eternal destruction is where you end up. It is a sad progression. It is a sad decline. Reflecting as well on on this description of these enemies... We might wonder, going in a different direction here, but an important one, arguably the most important one, we might wonder, why, why does Paul call such people enemies of the cross of Christ? We condemn their actions, but how are they undermining the work of Christ on the cross? We see, it's because these enemies of the cross of Christ that Paul has in mind here that he is warning about is, is not those who are simply out there in the world, who, who are atheists, who are agnostics, who have openly hardened their hearts against the Lord. It's because these enemies of the cross of Christ consider themselves to be part of the Christian faith, consider themselves to be followers of of Christ. They believe that Christ, he came, he died, paid for all of our sins, and that now they're no longer bound to any laws in any way, in any shape or form. 
So they could throw off every law. They could embrace every sin. Like God would simply just forgive them. And so who cares how you live? Isn't forgiveness great? I can live how I want. There have always been people like this. You think of the old covenant. How God warns of people who would go to Bethel and sin and and go to Gilgal and sin no more. And then they would bring their sacrifices in the morning. You can read about this in Amos 4. They would bring their sacrifices in the morning and their offerings and their tithes every third day. And they think, I'm all good with God. God is pleased with with how I live. He doesn't doesn't care about my lifestyle. All he cares about is if, if, if I come to church, if I give my offerings in the bag. Paul warns against such people as well in Romans 6, who would say, let us continue in sin so that grace may abound. And and I hope you see, brothers and sisters, that this is a direct attack on the cross of Christ. It is to strip the cross of its power. These enemies of the cross have so misunderstood the grace of God that they now abuse it. They turn it into an incentive to sin and licentiousness, and all forms of evil. Saying you don't, you don't have to feel guilty over the sins that you have committed. Who cares about your lifestyle? Don't you know Jesus has forgiven all of your sins? That is a half truth. It is true that Jesus has forgiven all of our sins. And when we come to him, all of our sins will be forgiven when we come in repentance and faith. But we are also called to flee from that lifestyle, aren't we? See, when Christ died on the cross, so so did we, who are united to him by faith. And so he didn't die to let us go on sinning. No, he crucified, buried, and put to death our sinful earthly nature. And now, though, though we are not yet perfect, those earthly things are no longer to reign over us. Now we, we are to hate and flee from them, knowing that, that Jesus had to die in our place for those sins we committed. And now in the power of the Holy Spirit, we offer our lives as a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Beloved, do not abuse God's grace. Do not live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Don't ever think that the cross is a license to sin and sin still more. And young people, stay away. Stay away from those who live this way, from those who invite you to join them. Remember, their end is destruction. That is their prize. So don't join them, brothers and sisters, on the wide path that leads to destruction. Instead, as we close, brothers and sisters, join in in imitating Paul and, and in all those who are mature in faith. And let us grow together in maturity. Let us help one another run on forward in faith. And let us together run on that narrow path that leads to life. Let us ever strive for that goal of perfection, ever keeping our eyes on the prize on Jesus Christ. And in the full awareness, in the full acknowledgement that Jesus Christ has already made us his own. Indeed, let us press on in his strength. As we will sing together in hymn 38, he is love's example. He is hope's attraction. He is faith's beginning and its end. He is the pioneer of our salvation. He is our mighty advocate and friend. And may those of us who are mature think this way. And may those of us who are mature live this way too. Amen.